So we're starting today on optimization or finding maximum and minimum or what we call extreme values for multivariable functions. So what's nice is that if you remember optimization from Calc 1, it's a pretty direct straight line between the two ideas. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit more complicated because we have more input variables to deal with. Um, but I think the way that we structure the process will feel very analogous to Calc 1. There's just a little bit more you have to contend with. So I'll give you a kind of a, an algorithm or a guide on how to do it in general. And then obviously the context will vary in the, in the practice problems you, you take up. So let's jump into that, shall we? So you can kind of think of this as how to use partial derivatives to find extrema. And this is, you know, local and absolute. So Again, local extrema meaning it's it's larger or smaller than all the points nearby and absolute means on the entire interval that we've defined what's the largest and smallest value so these are obviously of interest to optimization style problems where we're looking for minimizing cost maximizing revenue etc what's the the best or the worst outcome and then local um, maximum minima, obviously around certain points of interest. Um, what are the top values? Let me just rearrange my desktop here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is recall this process from Calc 1, including the extreme value theorem. And then we'll connect it to Calc 3, go through a few examples. Um, they do take a bit of work, so we won't go through that many examples, but we'll do as many as we can. So recalling from Calc 1, local extrema and absolute extrema. So let's say we had, you know, calc one, this is a single variable functions. Might have some interesting function that does something like this. I'm gonna extend this out a little bit. So between some A and B, we've got some curve. And we'd say, you know, we have some relative or local, another word we'd say is relative, extrema, which are, you know, around, compared to the points nearby, they are either maxes or mins, right? Peaks or valleys. And so these are, you know, f of x is greater than or equal to some f of, you know, c. We should say uh, f of x is or where C is any point. So this would be, right, a min or a max. And so to just to be like super abundantly clear, we're talking about in here, all these points C, the circle point is higher, so that makes it a max. So 
Why do I emphasize that? Well, because local means just in the neighborhood around the point, whereas absolute is talking the biggest and the lowest for the whole interval, right? So absolute extrema is on the whole interval or domain, largest and smallest values. So here's my absolute max, right, on the whole interval. Ended up not even being one of those local extrema. And my absolute min is down here. Happened to be one of the valleys. So if you remember, We broke this up into two parts. Um, we used derivatives to find these critical points, right? What did we do? Anybody remember what the process was? Uh, took the derivative and solve it for zero. Take the derivative and solve it for zero, right? So we would find points where f prime of x equals zero, and then check to see if f of p was a max or min. And we would either use the first derivative test or the second derivative test. Remember that? Check to see if it's um, concave up or down. Or check to see if it's, you know, increasing towards, decreasing away, or the other way around. We would test points on either side of the derivatives. That's how we would test these critical points or these interior points. Um, and I call them that because they're on the inside of this interval. So this would tell us um, whether it's a local max or min. And then how did we determine if something was an absolute max or absolute min? After you checked all the interior points, you would just check the, uh, the extents. Right. So for absolute extrema, we would compare f of p of interior points with f of a and f of b, the boundary points of the interval. So we were able to find critical points using derivatives and then use the derivative tests to kind of classify them. Um, remember too, that we could have a third possibility that when the derivative is zero, they could be a max or a min, or they could just be a plateau, right? So I might do something like this where it's, just kind of a pause in the rate of change. So the process was find the critical points and then go through and test them all.
right? Because just like in this picture here, just because you are a local max does not mean you're the highest point for the function on the whole interval, right? It might be the case that just using this B parameter, whether it's, you know, time, resources, whatever, turns out this is the best case scenario instead of in the middle of this interval of values. Does that make sense? So we have to test the boundaries as well as the interior points because you can create this illusion that these are the only things that matter when in fact it might be on the boundary. So the reason that we're going through that in such depth is because now our interval, quote unquote, or our input space is no longer a number line, it's a region, right? So we need to be able to test the interior of the region of points as well as the boundary of points around that region to say, we've covered all our bases in terms of finding max and min values, right? Of where our inputs can go into the function and we determine if they're maxes or mins or not. So it's nice to have this very clear uh, analogy from 2D calc. So I'm gonna show you quickly um, you know, you've seen this before if you've opened calcplot. But what an idea of a local max or local min means in this 3D context where we have the plane as the input and the height in the three space as the output. Right? Obviously these points down here at the at the valleys, these are local minima because the z values are lower than all the points surrounding it in a neighborhood. We say in an open disk containing the point. Right? So if I zoom in on this point here and project it up to the axis, let me see if we can uh, come into a trace point here. So if I'm like over here at that valley that I can draw an open disk in the in the two space here in the x and y plane and all the z values around here are going to be lower or higher rather sorry all the z values around here are going to be higher than this which is at the very base of the valley and you know just the opposite for this point up here any open disk containing this point, if this is the true critical point here, that this is the maximum Z value and all the others around it, just in a neighborhood around it are lower, right? Lower on the hill. So that's what we mean when we say local max or min. Now this obviously differs from being absolute max or min where we're talking about the, the global highest or lowest value, whether or not these are We'll, we'll look at later. All right. So let's shoot back to the notes. All right. So the Calc 3 version. For local extrema, we say for a region D or R containing the point AB, our AB is of interest, all right, and this is our function is some Z, which is a function of F, uh, is a function of X and Y. We have two statements here, one that f of a, b is a local max. If it's greater than or equal to all the other heights for all points x and y that are domain points, in an open disk around AB. Okay, so as long as the points are in the domain and a disk centered at AB, 
center it around. Then we say it's a local max. And then likewise, we'd say, you know, similar things that f of a, b is a local min. With the only difference being that the height is less than or equal to all other points. That are in the domain in an open disk around a, b. We got peaks and valleys. So one thing that we can notice without needing to prove, and maybe I will go back to our graph space here. I'll come back to the notes in just a second. If you come up to these points that I told you are most likely local maxes and mins, um, and we show the partial derivatives. What do you think is going to be the case about the derivative in the x direction at this peak here? Even just by looking at the cross sections here. What's going to be true about the partial derivative in the x direction or the slope of the tangent line in the x direction at that point? Will it be zero? Yeah, it'll be zero. Yeah, it'll be zero, right? It looks like the top of a uh, bell here if we're just looking down this way. And then the same in the y direction. So if I show the partial with respect to y, let me get oriented here. All right, and we come across. That should be zero as well, right? I'll have a horizontal tan tangent line. So at a peak and the same thing at a valley, f sub x and f sub y, or partial x and partial y, should both be equal to zero, right? They shouldn't be changing in either of those directions. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. Seems solid. Seems solid. Good. They trust me. Excellent. So what we can do is use that to drive an easier process. Let me get back to my notes here. Okay, where were we? So I was about to show you a theorem that you can use in one direction only. Okay, so based on the fact that we know that if you're a max or a min, your partial derivatives are going to be equal to zero. That's basically what this theorem says, right? We, we see it graphically, um, but this is what it says. If the function f of x, y has a local max or min at a point a, b, then the partial with respect to x, uh, let's put it like this, the partial with respect to x equals zero at that point and the partial with respect to y equals zero. So it's both. Another way you could say this is that the gradient of f at a, b is equal to the zero vector, right? The gradient which has components of the partial derivatives, that's equal to the zero vector. What's nice about that is maybe we have a, a an attack that, that gives us the gradient and, and then we get the partials from that. So we're gonna highlight this in an example, one where it works out nicely and one where we have to be careful, okay? Because what students typically do in terms of making a mistake here is going the other way around, which is saying, oh, well, if my gradient is zero, then it must be a max or a min, right? 
And the analog from Calc 1 is that you could have a critical point where the derivative is equal to 0, and then it's not a max or a min, it was a plateau, right? Um, and here we could have a plateau, or we could have something else arise. And we'll see what that is through some illustrated examples. So I'm going to do kind of two side by side. So I find the local extreme values. of f, which is x squared plus y squared, and g, which is y squared minus x squared. So I'll kind of split this down the middle and do them side by side here. So for f, We note that the domain is all points x, y in R2. That's fine, right? We don't have any domain problems to dodge. So what that means is that any extrema that appear are going to appear on the interior, right? And not at some boundary point because there is no boundary point. Um, and we also know that the, well, it doesn't imply this, but we see that the partials, which are 2x and 2y, exist everywhere. So this tells us that the local extremes can only happen where this is the case and this is the case, where the partials are equal to 0. Right, so the domain is wide open. The partials exist everywhere. So if there's going to be local extremes, the only place they, they could happen would be at these places where we have the partials are both equal to zero or the gradient is equal to the zero vector. So what typically happens is we actually get a system of equations here. Now this one's really simple. Sometimes they're a little complicated, um, but you need to be aware that the values we pick aren't just mix and match. They have to they have to be in the correct ordering. Okay, they have to they pair with each other. So that'll be clearer to see in the example after this. But for right now, we see that if x equals zero and y equals zero, this is the only place it could happen. So this is where x and y equal the point zero zero. So if there's a local max or min, it can only be at this point. And we know that all f values are going to be greater than or equal to 0 everywhere, right? Because we're squaring and adding the x and y coordinates. Sum up two squares, it's always going to be positive. So this has to be... A local minimum. And it turns out to be an absolute minimum as well, but we'll show that process later. Right now we're just looking for local extreme values. So, and if you remember this thing from 12.6, what this looks like, right, in either direction it looks like a parabola. So this is the paraboloid, right, the, the vase opening upward from the origin. 
So that makes sense that that would be the local min and the, and the global minimum. So let's take a look over here at this function, which looks slightly different. Again, we have that the domain is all real numbers. The partials exist everywhere. So if there's going to be an extreme value, it's going to take on uh, those values at a critical point. So I just got a question in the chat here. We're going to have relative max and min. Like if you're looking at max and min for x, this point works, but for z it wouldn't. Like if you're looking at max and min for x, this point works, but for z it wouldn't. I guess I would need a clarifying statement on that. So these are relative max and mins. They're relative to the other input points around them in the domain. So um, in an open disk containing a point, we'd say it's a relative max or min. And it only, <clears throat> according to the theorem, right, it only has to, um, or I guess, it's probably not true. But let's say you have a truncated cone, right? The entire circle at the top of that cone, like it's it's flat in reference to itself, but not to the rest of the surface that might create that. Mm -hmm. So would your um your is is any part of the top of that cone considered a min or max or not because it's you could make a smaller disk that excluded the rest of the truncated cone and then they would all have the same value they would all have the same z so it depends on which way the cone's oriented if it's upward like this right open circle on top that'd be considered the the boundary of the x and y points, right? And you can project that down and see, right, that circle that it inscribes on the x, y plane. And then we would actually test all of those points. That's a, that's a process for finding um, absolute max and min analytically. We know just by looking at it geometrically, right, that that is the highest z value, so it's all gonna be up there. And obviously if you slant it, you know, do, do something like that, it might get a little bit more complicated, but. So just had a, a follow-up question, flipping the orientation of the graph, changing where the maxes mins are relative to our view. In your example, the mountains disappear if we look over the top. Oh, I see. So you're saying relative to perspective. Um, we're not really going to get into that too terribly much. If you have an orientation problem of that magnitude, and I I'm, I'm, could be reading your question wrong, it would just behoove you to change the graph to be upright, right? Make make life simpler on yourself, so something like that. Um, but let me know if I didn't hit the mark there. We can we can keep going on that. But um, for this question, we've got again the domain is all real numbers. The partials exist everywhere. So if an extreme value happens, it's going to be at one of these critical points. Again, we see then you know, that it would be that these two would both have to be zero, which tells us that zero, zero is this critical point. But it's not so clear if this is a max or a min, right? Y squared minus X squared, this isn't always increasing away from this point. And you may or may not recall this thing. I'll pull this up here. Oh, 
right? But we've got the hyperbolic paraboloid, or as we approach it in the y direction, it seems to be a minimum. But if we look at it from the x direction, and maybe this is what the question was um, talking about. If we look at it in the x direction, it is a maximum, right? Looking at the traces in the xz plane versus the yz plane. This is both a min and a max. And this obviously could not have happened in 2D, where it could be both a min and a max. And so this is, okay. So it, 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 uh, this is what we call a saddle point. And this can happen. So this is what we have to be on the lookout for, and this is why we have to be so clear with our language around these definitions and why the theorem doesn't point in both directions. Right? You can have the gradient be zero at this point, but if we move in the x direction, it's a minimum, so it's lower than all the other values. And if you move in the y direction, other way around. If you move in the x direction, it's a max. If you move in the y direction, it's a min. Right? The z values are higher than uh, or lower than all those other values. That wasn't confusing at all. Great. So what we want to do is come up with a way to test these critical points, classify them, so we can do it analytically, so we can do it for a whole surface so we're not reliant on uh, graphing software or even the number of dimensions that we're in, right? So we need to be aware that just because the partials are both equal to zero, this does not imply um, extreme values. Could be a saddle point. However, the other direction is implied. If it is an extreme value, you know that the gradient is zero. All right, you're either at the bottom of a valley or the top of a peak, gradient zero. And that should also make sense based on the, um, you know, the kind of verbal description we gave of the gradient vector. What does it do? It points in the direction of the steepest ascent, right? If you're at the North Pole, you know, where's, where's the direction north, right? So if you're at the peak or at the valley, the gradient is going to be zero. It's not going to be pointing anywhere. So what we have to do to deal with this because now we have this issue where moving in the x direction or the y direction produces a different change in z um, as well as you know these surfaces can kind of twist and do things that we never really had to consider with um, with 2d functions so we're going to have to bring in the mixed partial derivatives, which kind of account for the mixed second partial derivatives, which account for that um, twisting, and use something which is called the Hessian or the discriminant as kind of a test. Now you don't need to know really what that is, but this is kind of what we use to test and see how twisted is this thing? Um, is it twisted enough to break it from being a max or a min, or is it neither of these? So how to classify critical points. It's still the best process to find where the derivatives are equal to zero and then go ahead and classify them afterwards to see was that a min or a max or no. Um, and likewise, or as a analogy to Calc 1 with the second derivative test, based on the sign of the second derivative, right, we were able to determine, oh, this thing's convex, or it's concave, or it's neither, right, or we don't know enough, we need to use something else. This has a similar feel to it, where we use this discriminant, and we say, based on the sign of this, this is telling us what's going on or that we need to go do something else, okay?
So suppose the function, its partials are continuous. on a disk centered at AB and we know that the partials at this point are equal to zero. So again, make sure your function's continuous, your partials are continuous. So that means that this function is differentiable here and that you know that your first partials are equal to zero. If that's the case, then we can test these points. And what we say is we let D be the discriminant or the Hessian of this point or at this point AB of F. And we say that it's equal to the second derivative with respect to x at a, b times the second derivative with respect to y minus the mixed partial squared. And what this really is, is it's the determinant of a matrix of second order derivatives. You don't need to know that. It can be helpful. Um, but it's, it's the cross product between uh, this two by two matrix of the second order partial derivatives. And the reason that we have the xy mixed partial squared is we know from Clairaut's theorem that this that both of the partials are equal right that doesn't matter which order you take the partials in they're going to be the same so we just square one of them and so you can think in some way this is like a uh, kind of like a test strip like if you're testing your soil or your water or something like this for how twisted this thing is at this point. All right, so this surface, how twisted are you? Are you twisted enough to no longer become a max or a min or you become a saddle point or maybe something else is going on? Okay, so then we have like on the back of the box what the test strip tells you. So if you know that the second order partial with respect to X is negative and that D this discriminant is positive, this tells you that the point AB is a local max. Now I said the second order partial with respect to X is negative and D is positive. Well, this thing's new to you, so I wouldn't expect this to make a tremendous amount of sense yet. But why does it make sense that if this is negative, then this point is a local max? What does the second order derivative tell you about? Uh, kind of yeah. Yeah. yeah, it tells you about the bend, right? So it's bending down. So if it's bending down, that must mean that in this direction, it is, um, it is a max. And why we only test the x derivative or in the x direction? Well, if that's negative and d is positive, right, then we know what's going to be the case. Um, we know it can't be the case that uh, the second order with respect to y is a different sign, right? That wouldn't be possible because the second term is squared, right? So we only need to look at one derivative with respect to x or with respect to y. So we just keep it with respect to x. So if it's concave down in the x direction and d is positive, then that tells us that this thing isn't twisted enough. It is actually a local maximum for the surface. 
Um, you know, you can kind of think of these as being more powerful than this, as like preserving its untwistedness. No one will probably say that anywhere else. <laughs> I, I kind of just made that up, but uh, it makes sense in my head, so maybe it'll connect with some of you. So this first term kind of wins out. That means that D is positive and that it's a local max. The second condition is, you can probably guess it, if the second derivative with respect to x is positive and d is positive, this tells us that a, b is a local min. So that means it's concave up there in the x direction, and then the same will be the case with the y direction. Third is if D is negative, then AB is a saddle point. Now to make some sense of that, it means that either it's, um, you can think about it like this. that the two signs here are different or that this term is just a, um, a heavier weight, right? That it's twisted so much that it becomes a saddle point or that in the X direction or the Y direction that they are different signs. That one is concave up and one is concave down. And then lastly, if d equals zero, uh, go make up your own derivative test. You know nothing from this one, okay? So, we know nothing. Try something else. Thanks for playing. You'll have to try maybe a graphical approach, maybe a numerical approach, um, but those will be rare. Usually this works out. So let's try this thing out for size. Find the extreme values for f of x, y. So x, y, all this thing's pretty big. I'm gonna bring this down here for x, y, minus x squared, minus y squared, minus 2x, minus 2y, plus 4. So again, we note the domain is all of r squared. There's no boundary points. So any extreme values are gonna happen at the critical points. So we're gonna go find those critical points. So you can set the gradient equal to it's zero. It's not a sigma, that's a zero aka find the partials and set them equal to zero. So the partial with respect to x of this thing is y minus 2x minus 2. And the partial with respect to y is x minus 2y minus 2. So then we set each of them equal to 0. Let's solve this and let's say, all right, well, this tells me that y is really equal to 
2x plus 2. And you've got to remember that this is a system of equations because we need both partials to be equal to 0 at the same time, right? So this needs to be the case while this needs to be the case. Oh, we'll do this in yellow. So um, x minus 2y minus 2 equals 0, right? And so we need it to be the case that... This whole thing is equal to 0, where y is this 2x plus 2. And then go ahead and solve. So what x minus 4x is a minus 3x. Minus 4 minus 2 is minus 6. So x is negative 2. And if x is negative 2, then I throw that back in here, and I get that y must also be equal to negative 2 at this point. So therefore, uh, negative 2, negative 2 is our only critical point. So we found the critical points. Now we want to classify them using the second derivative test. Use our test strip. So it means we need to find that discriminant or the Hessian, the value of the Hessian. So in order to do that, we need well, let's put a question mark here. In order to do that, um, we need, you know, we can shorthand it. The second order partials minus the mixed partial squared. So we need the second derivative with respect to x and the second derivative with respect to y. And then the mixed partial derivative. Luckily, these are pretty easy, right? We're coming off of here for our second derivatives. So differentiate the top one with respect to x, and you just get minus 2. Differentiate the bottom one with respect to y, you get minus 2. And then differentiate, let's just say, the first one with respect to y, and you should just get 1. Questions so far on any of this? Doing pretty good? Awesome. So then we plug these into our test strip here. So this is negative 2 times negative 2 minus 1 squared, which is positive 4 minus 1, which is 3. So d equals 3, which is greater than 0. So this tells us that we're good, right? That this thing's not a saddle point and it's not broken. Um, it hasn't broken our test. So D is positive and we know that the second derivative with respect to X is negative two, which is less than zero. So, Negative 2, negative 2 is what type of point? Local maximum. It is a local maximum. Great. And, you know, it might be a good exercise for you to throw this into CalcPlot 3D and just verify what you found algebraically. I'm not going to do it now, but... I'd say, you know, verify graphically. And we know that we can go ahead and find that value, you know, if we wanted to be a little bit more thorough. And if we plug in two and negative, or negative two and negative two up here, we'll get the height is at eight.
I'd say local max. So, Nick, yep. Quick question. It really doesn't matter that we're using FXX instead of FYY for that. Like, like either one of them will work for the discriminant test. So if one of them happens to look easier to work with, maybe you just go grab that one. Correct. Yep. Yeah, but I mean, you will have to, you would need them both anyway. You need both of their values anyway to use the test to determine D's value. Um, so it doesn't matter which mixed partial you take, if that's what you meant, the F of X, Y, F sub X, Y, or F sub Y, X. Sometimes one is easier to take than the other. I guess, I guess, yeah, that's, that's the one I was thinking of. Okay, gotcha. Yep. You will need both of the unmixed partials, but the mixed partial, you can choose which one you want because they are equivalent. Yeah. And I had another question in the chat. Can D equal zero? Yes, D can equal zero. It can happen, but it just means that the second derivative test isn't going to tell you much. Okay. All right. Let's see how are we doing on time here? Yeah, I do want to do this one anyway. We'll we'll figure it out. All right, example two. This one is to highlight one of the most common mistakes that's made with this process. So we'll go through this one relatively quickly if that's okay. Um, so we're gonna need the partial derivatives. So why don't you go ahead and try that real fast, just to kind of keep the brain active. So we'll need the first and second order partial derivatives, as well as the mixed partial derivative here. So I'll give you a minute to do that. That is a minus two right here. At y minus 2, x squared minus y squared. Just take a second, verify that your partials look the same. Do a lot of these on the fly now. So, you know, find the partials because you're going to need them anyway. Second is find the critical points. So that's where 
you know, first order partials are going to be equal to zero. So set two times y minus two x equal to zero. And let me do it like this x squared minus two y equals zero. So, you know, what this tells us here x equals 0 or y equals 2 will produce a 0 over here. And so we can use this, use these over here. Um, to test these points, will they will they generate a true equation in the second line? So we start with I would say y equals two. We've got x squared minus two times two equals zero. So we've got x squared minus four equals zero, which tells us that x is going to be plus or minus two. So what's important is to pair these things up. And this is the place where um, people often make mistakes because you'll start mixing and matching x's and y's when you get multiple critical points. These x values only work with this y value, right? These x values only work with this y value. So what this tells you is that you've got negative 2, 2 and 2, 2 our critical points from here. And then x equals 0. If I plug this in, let's 0 squared uh, minus 2y equals 0. So the only value that would work here would be y equals 0. So this tells me that 0, 0 is another critical point. So what I'm saying is, I'll often see people put uh, negative 2, 0, 0, 2, 0, negative 2, and just kind of mix and match things around because these are the x's and y's I found. But you got to remember that the derivatives have to be, the partial derivatives in the first order have to be equal to 0 at the same time, at the same point. All right. So when x equals 0, only y equals 0 will make that true for both. So here are our CPs, and then we go in and test them. Um, I'm going to fast forward through this part so we can get to the next example a little bit faster, but we'll say, all right, find your, find your D value, and it'd be good for you to, you know, come back to this, and, and like right after class, and verify that this worked. I'll write it up one more time that this is this guy. So this value at zero, zero should work out to be eight, which we know is positive. We know the discriminant at negative two, two. It should be negative 16, which is less than zero. And same for two, two. This is negative 16, that's less than zero. So what that tells us is these two are actually saddle points. Or is this guy up here? This has a negative second order partial unmixed. So that tells us that Zero, 0, is a max. And these two guys are saddle points. So I'll just say fast forward here. All right. So that's the second derivative test. 
It's a way to classify your critical points. And again, this order is important here. So I'll write that. Order is important for these systems of equations. Keep that straight. All right. So for absolute extrema, and we've been practicing finding uh, relative or local extrema so far, and what we have to do is go from testing just the interior points, which we've been doing, to including the testing the boundary, right? Just like testing the endpoints from the interval, now we're going to be looking at a closed region and going around the outside of that set, which would be, you know, if you think about it being on your desk, either a circle, a square, a triangle, whatever the set of points is, we can test all the interior points using the derivative test, because we can find that by looking at the derivative, seeing if we've got any peaks or valleys, and that's great. But then we got to compare it to the edges, right? Because maybe there's a relative, there's a, there's a valley or a peak in the middle, but then it shoots up and increases without having a zero in the derivative to the edge of the region, right? And this is actually the highest value of the function, all right? So if we're trying to maximize something, we don't care about this little blip in here. We're really looking at the edge of those um, of the intervals of our input variables. All right, so if it's time and man hours, and maybe there's some relative dip in here or, or max here, we really care about what's at the boundary, so we have to test that outer edge. So recall that we test the interior with the uh, critical points. And then we test the boundary points. And that's just something we're going to have to do in a methodical way, right? So you can really do it however you want, but probably being economical is best. So what we did was we tested the interior, we tested the outside, and then we looked at the actual height of the curve from each of those points, right? We got the x values where it happened, and then said, all right, how high are you, how high are you, and then compared them to each other. So that's the first thing to remember. The second thing to remember is that nice result called the extreme value theorem, which you know, if you took Calc 1 with me, I probably mentioned it in 30 seconds because it kind of just makes a lot of sense, right? If you have a closed and bounded interval and the function's continuous, you don't have to pick up your pencil, there's going to be a max and there's going to be a min, okay? That's actually a pretty important theorem. Um, we don't do a lot of proof, so it's just kind of a very intuitive thing, but it's it's important to note here because we're going to use it. Okay, and it said on a closed interval, meaning it includes its endpoints, if f is continuous, you don't pick up your pencil, Now, it might be a tie for the max and min value, right? But it will have one. So it proves that there exists a max or a min. And again, it's a closed interval. So the problem is that we need to do a little bit of massaging to make it work because now we have two inputs. So a closed interval. which you might have pictured as, you know, something like this from A to B. 
now gets Calc threeified to a uh, closed region or set. And it might look something like this, right? A, a circle around a point, a disc around a point, maybe a square or a triangle, something like this. Or, you know, it might be described in set notation. Where it's closed and bounded. And you can look in your text for some very quick definitions like formal definitions of what is meant by closed and bounded. Okay, a closed set is an open set that includes its boundary points, okay? And learning what a boundary point is is not too hard, but. So our sets are closed and bounded. And so if that's the case, if we're working on a set of x, y values, where we can pull a point out of any of this, and it's a it's a closed region, then what that says, and, and f is continuous, then we know that f attains its absolute max and min on some points in this region. Okay, so somewhere in here is the max, and somewhere in here is the min, and it might be on the boundary, or it might be in the interior of the set, but we're going to go find it. Okay, just like we did with the interval of single values. So we're going to have to be methodical about that. So the extreme value theorem in, uh, in this case, if f is continuous on a closed bounded set, d, which is a subset of the real plane, Everybody knows this notation, right? Yeah, you've seen it. Then F attains its max and min values. On some points x1, y1, x2, y2, in D. Okay, so one way you can kind of think about this, have some region D that has a boundary and an interior. At some point in here, the surface will achieve its maximum at some point in here. The surface will achieve its minimum. And you know, maybe it's doing something like this. And again, it's a surface, so it's 3D. Some something weird and wacky and wild here, but this is our so doing something like that domain is some region has a boundary so what we want to do is list the interior points so get those critical points find their values list the boundary points get their values get their heights right and then we view the lists and find what the max and min are going to be Let's actually write that down, so. Uh, let's say list. So it will be clear. 
after you find all those heights. And sometimes it can take some work and usually checking the boundary um, is where that work lies. So say let's find the absolute extrema for this function. 2 plus 2x plus 2y minus x squared minus y squared. On the triangular region in quadrant 1, bounded by x equals 0, y equals 0, and the line y equals 9 minus x. Okay, so we've cut out a little triangle that's serving as like our domain. And we're looking to see what are the highest and lowest values of the surface when we're zoomed in on this as our input space. So if you think in uh, R2, what this is going to look like. So 9 minus x is the line that starts at 0, 9 and hits the x-axis at 9, 0 and does something like this. Here's my x equals 0 is the y-axis, y equals 0 is the x-axis, and then Got this here. I'm going to call these points things so I can refer to them 0, A, and B. Or O, not 0. So we take a look at F. F is differentiable because its partials exist everywhere, right? It's just a series of power functions. They don't have any domain problems. So its partials exist everywhere, so it's continuous, it's differentiable everywhere. So this tells us that will be where um, extrema R, and we have to include boundary points. Before, the domain we were talking about was wide open. It was an open set. Here, it's closed. It's kind of like having a constraint for an optimization problem, right? So um, we have to stay within these sets. So we're going to test those as well as where the partials are 0. So that, I guess that would also mean that if you found a critical point of the function that was an x, y value that was outside of the triangle, you would just ignore it? Correct. Great clarification. So if there's a, if you find a critical point analytically and it's not in your domain D or it's not in your little region, then we're not going to worry about it. So again, to find these interior points, then we're going to take the partials and inspect them. So, you know, the partial with respect to x is what, just 2 minus 2x two and the same 2 minus 2y two for y. And so that tells us here that if we set this equal to 0, well, x has to be 1. 
and if we set this equal to zero, y has to be equal to one. So then the only interior critical point then is at one, one. And we know since we need to compare these values of the function later, we should go and find what that value is. So f of 1, 1 is 2 plus 2 plus 2 minus 1 minus 1, which is 4. Everybody with me on that one? Okay, find the partial, set them equal to 0. We only had 1. So it's good because the boundary is really where the work lies here. So what we're going to do is break it into three pieces, right? This piece, this piece, this piece. So we'll start with um, OA. So on this component of the boundary, what do we know? Well, we know that the y value is fixed to zero, right? So whatever points along here that we're testing, we know that y equals zero. So this tells us that on this boundary, that the function f of xy is really um, the function of x comma zero. And so in a lot of ways, it's operating like the single variable function. Two plus two x minus x squared. If you go back to your original function and just drop out the y terms because they're equal to zero, we get this parabola in the x direction. So that's a nice thing that happened because now we can find, right? You can think of it as looking at a variable of a single, looking at a function of a single variable. Let me say that backwards a couple of times. Looking at a function of a single variable and you know how to maximize that already, right? You know how to maximize a parabola. If you're looking at the surface just on this trace, it's really just a curve. And so we use calc one principles to do it. So you can think function of one variable on these values from zero to nine. So my input space are these X values. Let me draw that down here so we know what we're talking about. So how do we maximize a function of one variable? Well, we do what we're doing now, just a little bit simpler, right? We test the interior points, we test the boundary points. And we know this is a parabola, so you might kind of just know where these, um, where the max and mins are. But we look at f of zero, we look at f of nine, f of zero is just two, f of nine at the end point is going to be uh, what, two plus 18 minus 81 is negative 61. So four and negative 61, this is where the surface is at. And then anywhere in the middle, well that would satisfy the derivative test for one variable. So these are the you know endpoints, and now we think of the interior. Let me so we look at the derivative here, negative two x plus two. Set that equal to zero. So x equals one. 
is a critical point for this parabola. We know that f of 1 is 4 minus 1 is 3. And I've been kind of shorthanding these, which hopefully isn't confusing. You know f is a two-variable function, right? So it's not really f of 9. This is really f of 9 comma 0 is negative 61. f of 0 comma 0 is 2. f of 1 comma 0 is negative, is 3. So I've got these three values that are kind of on my list. So if you're feeling kind of lost, like just to think about what we just did, we've already tested the interior points in here using the critical points from the two variable function. Now we're walking along this edge as a trace and seeing what's happening at like the edge of the blanket. If the surface is a blanket, what's the height of that edge? And we're using single variable calculus to shorten up that process. And what do we do? We look at the endpoints and we look at the critical points, right? And we see what those values are. So that's what we're doing inside of this and just kind of looking at it in two dimensions. So now we have to do that for each other leg, okay? So we'll speed it up because the other leg is actually um, symmetrical. So if we look at OB, right, which is now this side, then we're looking at where x equals 0, which means we're looking at the function f of 0, y, which turns out to be a parabola that is exactly the same. So by the property of we don't have a lot of time, and also just symmetry, that this thing works out to have the same uh, critical points so that we that we test so we know that f of 0 0 which we already found is 2 and this will happen sometimes that your your boundaries will overlap at a single point you've already found f of 0 0 we didn't need to do that twice um, but f of 0 1 is equal to 3 just like f of 1 0 is equal to 3 and f of 0 9 instead of f of 9 0 is equal to negative 61 Okay, so we got three more points, but they had the same values. It's not always going to happen, right? This is a specific to this problem. But we did need to go in there and see that. Is everybody cool with blowing past that one? Okay. So AB is obviously the more interesting one because we're on a curve now, not an axis. So on the triangle, we're talking about this line. Y equals 9 minus X. So that means we're really looking at the curve F of X comma 9 minus X. Which looks like this 2 plus 2X plus 2 times 9 minus X. Minus X squared minus nine minus x squared. So where we see y, we're putting in the curve nine minus x. And you can expand this out. And what it ends up being is this. So what's good about this
we already tested here and here, right? The endpoints of that curve, A and B. So we really just need to test the interior points, which means we can use the derivative, right, of a single variable function. So just need to test the interior. So let's find f prime of x nine minus x. So it's just the derivative of this guy here, which is what, negative four x plus 18. Set that equal to zero. So what, x is 18 over four or nine over two? And so we know if x is nine over two, then this tells us that nine minus nine over two is just nine over two which is y. So we're looking at the point nine halves, nine halves. Is a candidate. And we then find what the height of the surface then is at this point, right? jumping from 2D back up to 3D, find the height at this point, and I will save us the fun there. But again, verify that is negative 41 halves. So now we see, all right, we've done all of the boundary with our testing, right? We tested all three edges, we tested the endpoints, and we've got one, two, three, four, five points, right? Six points. So we didn't want to double up on zero, zero. So now we compare their heights. What's the highest and lowest values you see? Well. Negative 61 seems to be contending for the lowest. And that's the lowest height of the surface. And now we're looking for the max height between two and three. Here's two and three and negative 61. Here's another min. And then negative 41 over two, that's just negative 20 and a half, so that's not even contending. And then we have to compare this also with the interior points. All right, I didn't put an asterisk up here, but this is the actual max height, right, at four. So at one one, which is like here, This is our absolute max. So you can imagine, you know, up here in the in the three space that it's got a height of four. And then that's the that's the absolute max for the whole thing over the triangle. And then the minimums occur at nine zero and zero nine, where the height's at negative sixty one. So it kind of shoots down and then here is a minimum, here's a minimum f of zero nine is the same as f of nine zero and that's equal to negative 61. So the surface is kind of shooting down into the negative octants down there. But you know, one way you could do it is you could, you know, list all the candidates and then do it a little bit more clearly. I was kind of just, you know, scrolling back. Um,
but then it might be a little bit easier to pick off what's the max and what's the min. From that list. And again, remember, this is the Z. So uh, a cool application, because I know this kind of feels like doing math in space, which it is, and it's fun enough on its own regard. Um, but I'm going to leave this with you to play with on your own. But it's a uh, multivariable constraint optimization problem. Which you would be equipped to do. And so you can maybe tack this onto your, to your homework. And you actually, you might even have one that's very, very similar to this. Um, let's say you've got a box and it's got a max shipping um, restriction. Where you've got, you know, X, Y, and Z dimensions. Um, this right here, the length of that around the box, they call that the girth. And that's equal to 2y plus 2z, right? That walk around the side. And so the constraint so whether this be for like shipping or for overhead storage in a plane is it can't be more than 108 the girth plus the length has to be less than or equal to 108 uh, linear inches so this is a three variable function, but what you can do is just solve for x here and then make a substitution. So then you've got volume is really a function of y and z where x is 108 minus 2y minus 2z times yz. And now you can maximize dimensions. Well, find maximum volume, really, given the dimensions. That's the function you're trying to maximize. So that might be a fun uh, little problem to chase down and apply what you just learned testing the boundary points um, given by the constraint and then the interior points using your derivative tests. And, you know, it's not, it's, it's a degree two power function. So it'll look a lot like what we just did. But we ran a little bit over, uh, so I'm gonna stop it there. So that is finding max and min values using the derivatives. Again, a bit of a process. Um, but the biggest thing is to test the interior and test the boundary. Uh, so questions there before we call it. All righty. Well, take care, and we will see you next time for exam number two. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Have a good one. You too. Thanks.